good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think we, not, not I think, we are starting this BPF gender session um, right now. My name is Bruna Santos. I am one of the BPF um, co-facilitators for 2019. And um, for starters, I would like to begin um, thanking my co-facilitators at this BPF, um, Agustina Caligari, Maria Paz Canales, which is by my side, Chennai Chair, here, <laughs> and um, our consultant, um, Anhiet. Um, this, is, this is a BPF that's been, it's part of the intersectional work of the, the IGF, and we're very proud of being here and presenting it here and having it running for maybe the fourth year, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, five years. <laughs> and now just, just for starters, um, our agenda for today will be, I will do a short um, presentation on the best, the best practice forum on gender and access. And then I will give the floor to Henriette right after that to present our draft report. As you may know, um, all BPFs, they have to present a draft report for discussions. And the aim of this session is generally to listen to your input on these issues and, and subjects that we propose for 2019. So um, BPF Gender and Access has been addressing barriers faced by women and girls to access internet, use and make the most of it um, for the past five years. And this year, um, building on previous, previous works years, um, we decided to examine the opportunities and challenges that women and gender diverse um, persons and groups face once they have some form of access to internet. So it's almost the, the post-access moment. We're trying to bridge, um, to bridge it a little bit with the, the ongoing and the, the post-access. Um, in previous years, the, the BPF has looked at violence against women, actual barriers to access, and um, now we are starting to think of a more um, practical or maybe more um, well, yeah, practical approach to this. So um, I'm not going to say more than this, and I'll give the floor to Henriette um, to do a short presentation on our report. And thank you very much, Henriette. Thank you very much, Bruna. Is it possible to display what's on the screen of this computer? What do I need to do to get no, I think we need to clone the display because I'm getting a blank screen right now. But it's, I opened a document from Chrome, so that yeah. might be... <coughs> no, because normally we used it for... Um, okay. Got it, thank you. Well, welcome very much. Um, um, to the session, just to add to what Bruna is saying, we're just bringing up not a presentation. I'm just going to show you the the the, the table of contents. So, firstly, the process that we used was to to, as Bruna said, build on previous best practice forums, and um, and identify a topic based on that. Then we went to the community and asked for input, and we got a really rich range of, of inputs. We got 25 inputs. Um, two of them were very misogynistic and anti-feminist, and I think it was actually that in itself, I think, is, is, is um, significant. Um, and, and based on that and the research that people have done, we compiled this report. So I know this, is, you probably can't see because of the let me see if I can make it a bit bigger. Where is my control plus? Where's the plus one there? I can't zoom up. That's a little bit bigger. Okay. So the theme. The theme is... Um, Just bear with me. Okay, the title of the report is Beyond Access, Women and Gender Diverse People's Participation in the Digital Economy. Um, 
the report has much more about the participation of women, less so um, on participation of gender diverse people. The process that we're following, I said we had the call for input, we have a draft report based on that, based on some research, but the report is not complete. So the purpose of this session is for you to give us further input into the, into the report, and we have about two weeks to finalize the report. So, well, I have about two weeks to finalize the report. So essentially, I would like people in this room to, to commit to in the next, maybe until Monday, to send additional um, input. Um, the structure of the report at the moment, now let's hope I can do this without losing my place in the document, is um, the background, which Bruna has just covered. Then the, the next se uh, section is really looking at defining digital economy, because that actually emerged. One of the questions we asked people in the call for input is what do you understand digital economy? What does, what does digital economy mean in your context? And we got nuanced responses. I mean, there's some people who have a very um, fixed understanding of what the digital economy is and who look at it as one integrated globalized economy. And then some people said, but there are many different digital economies and there are local digital economies as well as national and regional and global. And, and so clearly just how one defines the concept and, and to what extent that allows you to have a sense of control and participation also emerged as important. Um, we did use a definition um, that was developed by the, the team at the University of Manchester, um, um, Richard Heeks's unit, um, Diode, which is the, um, um, Chennai, what, is, what does that stand for? It's the, it's a, it's a, it's a, they're one of the most established ICT for development research in, institutes. And you'll, I'll show you the diagram a little bit later. Then we looked at the next chapter, which was developed with some of the co-authors. So this, this report is a collective um, product. So we had Maria Paz and Bruna and Chennai and um, Cynthia Khoury, who isn't here, and um, Agustina um, Caligari. So it's, it's really a, collective of, uh, a collection of people who contributed. The next section, which is called Beyond, Beyond Access, Structural Discrimination and Cultural Norms and Barriers. Um, that was developed mostly by Maria Paz. And this is, I would say, perhaps also a bit of a theoretical um, um, section. And what this section does is it looks at digital space as a political space. And it also looks at the participation of women and gender diverse people as, 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 as a process which takes place within the context of structural factors of discrimination and exclusion. And so in a sense, it frames the work in the report. I think what this best practice forum is trying to come up with, policy recommendations, but policy recommendations that are embedded in a broader analysis of, of what discrimination and exclusion actually, um, or how it's constituted and how it operates. So from the outset, the best practice forum uh, coordinators didn't want to approach it in a simplistic way. Um, which sometimes does happen in the ICT field, which is if you train women, they'll be empowered. If you give them handsets, they'll participate in, in the digital economy. So the, so the report actually starts off by doing this more analytical and political analysis um, that looks at, at patriarchal structures and discrimination and power more broadly. Then we look specifically at skill and capacity development. And there we had really good contributions. We had contributions of, of projects that are working, um, work that people um, have done. But we also had the, the benefit of the equals research group. Is there anyone in the room here who was part of the equals research group? Put up your hands. Kemli. So equals is, uh, is an initiative that exists within the UN system, um, ITU, UN Women, um, UNESCO are involved in it. And the equals research group, which is made up of, of independent um, network of researchers from around the world, have just produced a very nuanced report on skills. 
And again, their conclusion, looking at lots of different examples and cases, is that it's not a simplistic problem, and that simply skilling women and having skilling programs does not actually produce um, real change. You need to look at other factors as well. Cultural norms and barriers are enormously important. And other forms of actually having control. So it's not just about skill and, and, and access to tools. It's also about having some kind of control and influence over how you participate in the digital economy. And Bruna was our key author for that um, chapter. Then we have chapter six, which is looking at access to infrastructure and devices, meaningful access, affordability, autonomous infrastructure and community networks. So in this chapter, we had the benefit of contribution from people from the community networks movement. Authors for this chapter was Chen Nai, Chen Nai Che, and Cynthia Hori, who is part of the um, community networks movement. And, um, and they have a set of really concrete recommendations on how linking control over infrastructure and service provision um, creates a platform for more empowered engagement with the digital economy. So women and gender diverse people, not just as users of, of technology, but actually as, as drivers and owners of, of internet services at a community network level in particular, but there are also other models. And then we, the, the next chapter is, looks at gender and the digital workplace, um, the gig economy, mainly looking at platform work at the moment. So um, it, there's, 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 again, we're lucky, there's, some re there's a lot of research on, on platform work at the moment. And, um, and as you'll see when you look at the chapter, there are different types of, of platform work. And it's important to understand that as well. And in fact, there's, there's, there's still not a lot of gender disaggregated data about platform work. In fact, many of the micro work platforms don't necessarily even identify um, uh, people, people by gender. But there are some studies that are emerging on online work. So there's, there's sort of micro work where you do um, work through a platform. Often you need to be fairly skilled, maybe have a skilled, have some, have some coding skills. But then there are also platforms that are used to a little bit like you know, Uber type platforms used by sex workers, used by domestic workers, where people, it's like outsourcing um, platforms. And I found one study that really did look at gender. And, and just, it's not in this version of the report, it will be in the next one. I found IT for Change has also done some research. Um, and the, the trends are really disturbing because what it seems to indicate is that the same patterns that you have in the workplace, in the offline workplace, um, are repeating themselves. The same kind of woman in domestic work, for example. Women who do platform work because they can do that and still look after their children, do all the cooking and do all the domestic labor. So the, the sort of same patterns of exploitative um, um, labor practices that women are subject to in the offline labor market is being replicated um, online. Similarly, where research has been done on, on, on pay differentials, um, they, men are paid more, more than women. No data about gender diverse people, but certainly um, there's in, in terms of the, the difference between men and women. And then generally, broadly, working conditions in online work and platform work is it's, it's, it's very exploitative. There's very little opportunity for workers to organize. They're very fragmented, very distributed. So um, that is an area, and I think that, well, the positive thing is that the, the ILO, the International Labor Organization, is doing a lot of research on this and is trying to take this concept of fair work onto the, the, into the digital workplace. And in the Oxford Inter Internet Institute, um, and I think some of them are actually here at the IGF. I, um, I, I saw that Mark Graham um, is presenting something. They've done a lot of research on that as well. So I think I get the sense that, that there's a lot of data 
um, beginning to emerge about platform work. What I have not found a lot of evidence on are advocates, civil society groups, rights groups, and even um, workers' rights groups beginning to take that on as an area for policy, policy change. But the research, the data is actually there that indicates this is an extremely exploitative, uh, exploitative sector and um, that could just deepen if there's not some kind of intervention at the policy level. Um, and that's really it. I think in, this, in, in section eight, we, we have short uh, bits of uh, text on access to finance, which is actually a very important area. And again, there's some research that um, there are patterns of gender discrimination around access to um, venture capital, for example, access to loans. Um, not a lot of research, I felt. Not, not you know, maybe I, I should have looked further, but um, there's not enough data on that. Um, and then there's also a section in there which this, this emerged from the community as an important area, and maybe we can develop that further, but privacy, security, and safety online is a very, it's a real consideration for, for, um, for workers. It's important for gender diverse people, sex workers um, who do not feel that they, that they, that they can actually, ha that they have the privacy or the security, they live in fear, they, they don't want to disclose that they're engaged in online sex work, um, and yet for many of them it's the only form of, of, of income. So the, the issues, there's, there's strong awareness of how important privacy and digital rights are in this online workplace. Good. Thank you very much, and yet, um, just also just mention the, sorry, um, this is the report, which you can look at. There's also a very long and I think useful list of resources, because when we put out the call for input, many of you sent out resource, uh, sent in resources. And that's a growing document that can live on the, on the internet. As I said, I only found the IT for Change research last week. Um, but there's a lot of, it has research, it has links to organizations, and it's categorized. It has support groups for women in the tech sector, for women coders, um, research initiatives, and also rights and support and capacity building and training research initiatives. So that's a growing resource that um, hopefully people will be able to use in their work. Thank you very much, Anhet. Um, this is Bruna again, for the record. Um, as Anhet explained, I guess um, access itself has never been the sole purpose of this BPF. So we want, and, and the reason why this, we are continuing this work is to properly assess how is the onboarding of women and gender diverse groups in the digital environment. And um, on that note as well, I guess I speak on behalf of every single co-organizer here that we are very thrilled to expand the focus of the BPF. We're shifting to just solely women to women and gender diverse groups and, and people. So this is um, truly a great thing to do. So the second segment will discuss um, how gender considerations impact the ability of women and gender diverse people to participate in the digital economy. And we have some triggering questions for our panelists. We have six panelists um, for this part. Each will have five minutes. And um, if, yeah, um, it will have five minutes and then I'll just go through the questions just so everybody goes. But I think we can also try to, to share the screen on the session, the questions, but I'll, I'll do this afterwards. So um, our triggering questions will be, the first one, what further cultural norms and barriers do women and gender diverse people have to confront in gaining man meaningful access to the internet and extracting value for themselves, their families, and their broader societies? Um, what is women and gender diverse people's experience in gaining the necessary skills to participate in the digital economy? The third one will be, um, what is women and gender diverse people um, experience in accessing financial support and services needed to be part of the digital economy? Um, what is women and gender diverse people's experience in gaining us access to infrastructure and devices to participate also in the digital economy? Um, um, yeah, and um, these groups as well experience in participating or in trying to participate at the digital economy as workers, developers, or entrepreneurs. 
Um, some key recommendations for um, that the panelists will be able to, to offer for incorporating gender perspectives in building a truly inclusive digital economy and what lessons have we learned from specific models that have been trying to promote women and gender diverse people's participation. Um, for this session, I guess we're, go we're gonna start with Nicole, Nicole Peter Patterson, and you have the floor for five minutes, Nicole. Thank you very much. Need to turn this on. Thank you very much, Bruno. Let me um, tender my apologies um, at the start because as I indicated to my colleagues that I'm a member of the Equals Skills Coalition and uh, the Equals, uh, the ITU Equals program will be having their Equals Awards at 520, which I'm a key part of. So I appreciate the opportunity to go on first. Um, Speaking to a number of the issues that you've raised, I'm going to speak from the experience of the work that myself and my colleague, along with um, a number of different partners, are doing across the Caribbean. And that's under a program called Caribbean Girls Hack, which is linked with Equals and with the ITU Girls in ICT Day related to building uh, skills, digital skills of girls across the Caribbean to do exactly that, bridge the digital gender divide. And it's very interesting, these um, uh, triggering questions that we have, because we, this year, this is the third year that we've done the hackathon. Um, we're happy to say that we've had some 600% uh, increase in terms of the number of participants over the past three years. And this year, we also did a sample survey of some of our participants actually looking at some of the issues that you're speaking to in terms of um, cultural issues. So, and, and I, I know that the Caribbean would consider itself very um, diverse and open in terms of cultural context, but just to give you a, a bit of a flavoring in that, we had a question that was looking at what are some of the challenges that the girls face in their countries um, in terms of promoting ICTs. And it's very interesting to note that from the target group, from the, 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 the sample group, that the highest at 46.7% of respondents said it was limited content, relevant content. Now, I just came out of the session that was um, one of the plenary discussions, and they were speaking there about the importance of relevant content, and I think even relevant content even beyond our situation in the Caribbean, speaking about different languages and that kind of thing and how important. Just to reiterate that the target group here is between age 13 to 23 years, so that's girls from high schools through university, who um, we do have the high schools girls trying to catch them early before they've decided which programs they will continue with, and um, and then of course university girls to to give them their, uh, different opportunities. But that is quite a significant one, and also from the cultural context, girls indicated um, that they find that predominantly the ICT courses are largely male, and they find that intimidating. So I'll speak a little bit more, well, I can actually touch to it now, that one of the things I do, the other questions that we had for them afterwards were saying, okay, well, what are some of the ways that you think um, ICT skills training can be more responsive and more, um, have a, a better environment for you? And they are, they had indicated boot camps that would be more targeted for girls so it, it's not that they want to separate themselves, but I think that they, they feel that level of intimidation from um, being with the boys. Um, you also mentioned, um, you were speaking a while ago in terms of some of the privacy issues. And in fact, some 21.2% of respondents, which is a fourth highest point, indicated cyberbullying as one of their largest concerns. Now, a number of you may know the work of uh, Chennai's colleague, Dan Raj Thakur, that we're very happy to claim as a Jamaican, <laughs> <laughs> who had also done some work, some research work from the, um, while at the Web Foundation, looking at some of those issues that we face. I think his research was specifically looking at at Jamaica, he did in fact point out, just as you were saying in terms of the limited research that's out there in other contexts, that there is little research in the region to date examining the relationship between, and this is now looking at, let's say, 
gender-based violence. Oh, you're timing me. <laughs> I was like, okay, what's that? <laughs> and ICTs. Um, but nevertheless, um, the issue of online safety vis-a-vis -vis the exposure to cyberbullying is regarded as a pretty high issue. So when we now look at the question of content, interesting to note that a, a few things. One, that Jamaica has over 53% of our persons who are on Facebook are women. Mm -hmm. Women. And it's interesting to note that in terms of relevant content, they were saying, could we get 67.3% of our respondents were saying it would be great to have more information on work opportunities. I'm saying that to say because we have anecdotally information that quite a significant number of young women are looking for work through Facebook. And actually, where, where there is some limited correlation is the fact that that has exposed them to significant GBV. So I'll just touch two last things, which is education and healthcare are the other areas that are seen as well that would be very interesting to girls in terms of, of um, relevant content. And my time's up, so I'm stopped speaking. Hopefully the information that was shared will be useful and I look forward to working with the BPF some more. Yeah, that's what, yeah, yeah, by Monday. Yes. <laughs> Please do. By, okay, Tuesday. Yes. Tuesday latest. Okay. Thank you very much, Nicole. Um, I'm going to give the floor right now to Chennai. Um, also one of our co-facilitators on this. I skipped the order, but Chennai, now you're up. <laughs> Thanks very much, Bruna. And um, just as Nicole was talking about the importance of research, so it's, it nicely segues into what I'm going to talk about. And uh, unfortunately, it won't be ready by Tuesday, but it's <laughs> something worth to note. But um, I think from our perspective as Web Foundation, one, we have a focus on women's rights online. And this year, we're actually conducting surveys in um, four countries, Colombia, Indonesia, Ghana, and Uganda. And that serves to understand one of the issues that you're raising of it, what it is that women and gender diverse people do online. And it does have components that try to understand like the barriers and the activities that they carry out online. Because in terms of addressing the cultural questions, there definitely is need for um, different methodologies around research to understand why is it that participation online in the digital economy is difficult. We are aware that access, um, affordability to devices um, is a challenge. Digital skills and literacy is still a challenge. And even the we've now launched an understanding of what is meaningful connectivity from a web foundation perspective. Because what we do understand is that even if the device has been produced, and in order for you to carry out the activity online, you need good quality um, connection at a good speed that does allow for you in, in one of our focus groups, a participant said, I need internet that allows for me to watch a one minute video in one minute. Mm. So that's already an indication that if we want to have in understanding how it is gender diverse <laughs> participation carries out online, we also need to understand do we have the infrastructure and resources in place that allow for people to actually be able to fully participate on the platforms. And then another thing that uh, will be in our research is also trying to understand the extent to which people are part of um, are financially included, in particular women, because that is where the issue is in terms of access to resources in order to be able to um, carry out online activities. I've, um, I think this is public information, but Facebook did conduct a research on um, women who are using their platforms for economic activities, and I can share this with you, Henriette. Um, and it was a matter of actually pointing out that most of them were funding from their families and their communities, and it was much more difficult to get um, loans from the bank because of their profile of being a woman, and they didn't have enough capital to be able to then bring that back as a way of leveraging that. So I think from our perspective as Web Foundation, actually building the research base to understand the level of financial inclusion that women and gender diverse people are, and in terms of actually do they have access to formal banking, we know some of these countries, Uganda for example, um, a huge extent of mobile money, but it could be a different case in Ghana. So there's a need to completely understand that. And our framework tries to understand it from, from a perspective of the REACT framework, which is rights, education, 
access content and targets and this is where the policy discussion comes in what are the targets that policymakers have put in place to have gender responsive policies not gender sensitive policies the difference is that what we find is policymakers will have a line of gender and they'll talk about the economy and then they'll say as long to ensure an economy that includes women but when you ask them what the targets are or do they have other um, initiatives that do allow for funding that's targeted at gender diverse people and women, what you then find is that either they stick to the ITU level or they will say, well, if there's a certain ministry that knows about it, we will figure it out. So that's sort of like what's exciting about the research that we're going to do to be able to unpack the level of the targets that are involved. Because it does, um, have, we do have the quantitative component and then we have the qualitative focus groups and then we have the key informant interviews. And I think the IGF community as a whole would benefit from having this research to be able to engage um, with data that is nationally representative and takes into account diverse people. So that's, <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that's, that's basically your work. And one of the investments is that in trying to get a, yes, quickly, a gender <laughs> responsive um, policy, one of the work that is done by my colleagues in the policy team is to actually have an e-skills uh, training for policymakers, which would then allow for, if we are campaigning for a digital economy that everyone can benefit from, let us work around capacitating um, policymakers and then highlighting to them why gender is something that they should really focus on instead of just simply ticking the box. So those are my five minutes. Thanks for that. I, no, I just wanted to highlight, because it appeared to me, but maybe there are people and other, other speakers who can comment on this. But you know, my traditional micro lending um, um, over the, I'm talking about the last 50 years of micro lending um, and development usually favored women because women were better payers. They were better micro borrowers. And if there's a difference in this trend in this digital space, which it appears to be at the moment based on, on the data that I have seen, I think that's a very significant finding. Thank you very much, Shanae and Um Yeah, it's, it's also in our draft report that this part of inclusion and including women and gender diverse groups from the very beginning will allow us not only to one day maybe attempt in, non, in having less biased technologies, but also policies. So this is a very good point that you both highlighted in your in interventions right now. So I'll give the floor to Hamle right now. And yeah. All right. Um, hi, my name is Lina Hjazi, and here with me are my colleagues, Alison and Marwa. Um, Hamla is a human rights organization um, that focuses on Palestinian digital rights, and we have recently published um, this uh, study on uh, gender-based violence online um, and the political participation also of Palestinians in the digital economy. Um, I have a lot to talk about, I think, but I'm going to try to cover as much as possible. Basically, I can start off by saying that Palestinians have some, actually some of the highest literacy and education in the world, and more women are in higher education than men. Um, but with the violations that are happening towards um, Palestinians, you know, human rights violations, and the ongoing occupation of Palestinians, uh, which is utilizing as well patriarchy to fragment the Palestinian society and then turn the violence inwards. So the occupying power, which in this case is Israel, also uses extortion uh, measures on women in the online space. Um, Palestinians have historically been surveilled as well by the occupation, and so they're always like including women, of course, in a state of constant uh, paranoia in the digital, digital space. Um, and so also this digital space has amplified this fear um, and families have a lot of fear of uh, like, you know, they, they try to prevent their children, especially women, from like um, participating online because, uh, because this can basically create risks for them in the offline sphere, um, just like different forms of offline violence. So there's uh, increased control of women's online freedom of expression and ability to participate in digital economy as well. Um, the good thing is that there has been investment in the Palestinian, um, like there has been investment from Palestinian uh, private companies and organizations um, helping uh, women's um, 
building capacity uh, to become entrepreneurs. For example, there is this um, online e-commerce store, which is um, an online lingerie e-commerce store that has now just uh, recently uh, been uh, uh, launching its project um, regionally. Um, and other than that, women also are mostly discriminated by online financial service companies, um, such as PayPal, and which, ha which we have recently uh, published a report that restricts, that shows that how they restrict, um, are there like digital economies being restricted. Um, another thing is Palestine, Palestine only recently got 3G actually, um, so which, which in the rest is like it's not competitive with the rest of the world and suppressing Palestinian digital uh, development. Um, Israel has, make, has been making electricity cuts and bombed the ICT infrastructure in Gaza, which has also created barriers for entrepreneurs to the successful businesses or to, be, you know, to run successful businesses. Uh, Israel's control of import and export systems also has um, made the import highly costly and making electronics as well difficult to obtain for women and which is also outdated. So despite the challenges uh, women face as well, um, as I said, there are like the private sector and NGOs that have been like enabling and enhancing women's um, skills and uh, capacity to grow some businesses such as like having different um, entities that like provide trainings for women and such. Um, my recommendations would be to first of all like end economic discrimination. Um, in which to allow actually Palestinians to have online platforms where they could, you know, access um, and gain economical opportunities as well, which, which you know, as now we have this economic blockade, so that would be great to just like try to find ways within the social media companies and within the financial service uh, payment companies that can try to put some pressure on um, governments such as Israel in order to end this uh, economic blockade. Thank you. Oh, perfect. perfect. Thank you. Best panelist so far in terms of timekeeping. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Alison. Um, moving on, I will now give the floor to um, Shalini. Um, you have five minutes, Shalini. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Shalini. I'm from uh, India. The, my organization name is called Janastu, which is in Karnataka, Bengaluru. And the, I work for a community network. I'm uh, one of the peer members of um, APC. Um, so, uh, so everyone are talking about, it's good to hear like about on the, all the good works that people are doing on the agenda. Uh, it's mostly on the digital, online digital. So I'll be mostly talking on how, because uh, the, the area where we work, it's, it's mostly a remote area and we don't have a good internet connection. And I'll be mostly talking about how we are solving some of the problems with uh, offline technologies, uh, mesh, using mesh or Wi-Fi technologies, how, how we are trying to address some of the uh, things for the women. Um, so first of all, like I would uh, introduce, I want to introduce, uh, uh, how women are participating in the digital economy is like, so we have a, a small space called craft space. We have given an open space for them where they can like come and uh, do. Uh, so this is one of the craft, it's called craft of space where they build uh, baskets, uh, create baskets, something. So this is a small radio device. <laughs> so I'll, I'll come to this thing, but like something th like this, they uh, they produce. Uh, it's from it, this is created from a local resources available in the uh, area, and they build uh, they uh, they uh, uh, do the baskets, all this kind of small stuffs, uh, and how so so they do at this at the smaller area there, but uh, so what we have given them a space, uh, 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 building a small. Uh, mesh setup for them uh, where they can upload their uh, local uh, uh, local skills or local development whatever they are doing like the the, the, the scraps or like how they want to wanted to uh, 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 
share amongst the villagers or like how they want to market it it's it's all through their uh, phone they we have given them each we have given each of them a phone i'm basically giving a, a, a platform for them to use so we have given them uh, phones uh, tech, uh, wi-fi uh, services uh, this one one way of accessing for them to like uh, express uh, ex uh, 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 to express themselves how what what they feel about the uh, platform in their uh, area uh, if they want to express so what so so there, there are different mediums that we have created uh, for them uh, so one such uh, is uh, so the women uh, uh, so the the the, world, the the space that they were talking about is a crafter space that I was telling where the women from across the village they come together sit and uh, do craft they do uh, talk about like uh, uh, what they are doing and and so one person uh, there's a master trainer uh, it's uh, her name is called Siddhava so what she she hailed from a different city uh, completely from a different city to just to provide uh, whatever the skills she has. Uh, learnt or like whatever she knows how she can like teach to other women in a different place it's, it's very rare that happens that no, uh, no woman a whole family wants to move just because uh, they want to share their knowledge to some other woman in the place so it, it, it very rarely happens in, in the scenario and like so how they share this so this woman she comes from a different place and she, she is there and how the local villagers uh, help uh, okay already <laughs> okay how how the local women uh, help them to like uh, being in their culture like because she hails from different and some person they are like different from different different cities there are many people who have come together to like share share what they the work and how and one per, one local person who knows about the technology i mean the, these are like low literates or print impaired people who just understands uh, media not that really the text but uh, when we gave the devices and and everything how how the one person who is like in 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 generation how like how she teaches the other people how how she how you can use the technology and like uh, how you can use uh, how you can browse it how you can like uh, share your skills how you can uh, use the uh, uh, if if it's if very little internet also how you can share your knowledge on the internet or like how you can like become uh, a pull a business uh, thing on the internet is like how like this open the open space that is created for them is is, is shared among this and one quickly so it's all it's not just <laughs> uh, the women there but like all them also the men feel like the the space how they can participate in the open space that is created for them like it's gender is just not there should be equal balance where like the men women both can participate to bring something good within the culture so so that happens when we uh, give a good space for them this is what like we are trying to do with this and we have this radio uh, where the women and the men both want to exp uh, uh, when they want to express something they do they do through this like i mean when they want don't want to share something in public but like they want to share through some other medium it's like this this standalone uh, radio community radio that we call uh, we record through through this we have like many uh, 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 many uh, uh, reused materials like this is from one of the craft we have used the old telephone booths uh, solar solar powered <laughs> raspberry pi so, so many such devices that we have created so that they don't feel like what this medium is just for them to attract to exp come and express what they want to tell like and to share so some some things thanks great thank you thank you very much Shalini um, up next we're gonna have Kimli Kamachu from Came in, oh, from Slobatsu. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I really feel very honored to be in this amazing table. Um, I, I'm Camila Camacho. I'm from Costa Rica. We work in Central America region, and um, I am from Sulabatsu. Um, because we have, I have just five minutes. I really, I'm going to just highlight three points, three specifically points, even if I can share 
long things. <laughs> um, and we work, and, or the, the work that I would like to present is the work that we do with women in the IT industry. Uh, I have to say that uh, only 15% of the students' uh, computer careers or informatic are women. Only 10% of the engineers uh, developing technology in Central America are women. And only 2% of the entrepreneurs or uh, enterprise owner are women in Central America. Uh, and uh, then, because of that, we have, um, we have developed, uh, since nine years, a network of women in the IT industry, women in technology, women interested in produce technology. We are, at this point, 800 women from all over Central America. And we, together, we develop uh, action research to understand and to study our own reality as women in the IT industry. Uh, the program, the name is uh, TICAS, and uh, the objective of our program is not to integrate more women in the IT industry, but to create a leadership uh, of women in the IT industry to change the IT industry. This is the objective that we have, that we pro have proposed for ourselves. As I said, we have been working on that for nine years, and I would like to present just three specific points. Uh, at this moment, especially the last two, three years, there are the amount of programs trying to integrate in women in the IT sector is increasing and is incredible the amount of programs coming from private uh, sector, coming from the public sector, and even from civil society. Uh, but uh, in general, we think um, if we look um, uh, in details, we understand that many of these programs are moved by the a strong need of the industry to have human resources. If uh, they don't, uh, they can't integrate women in the IT industry, IT industry is going to be in danger. For instance, in Costa Rica, the IT industry needs 8,000 human resources per year to continue growing up. And Man are not enough to cover that. Then that's why we have to think to look very well this specific program to integrate more women in the in the IT industry. And um, in the research that we have done, we also uh, have um, really a lot of data and a lot of uh, information and a lot of evidence that the difficulties for women to be in the IT industry because because uh, the culture, the, the um, professional culture of the IT. And this professional culture of the IT is uh, really an expulsive culture of the diverse, even if they need women, for instance, and diversity. Then, and this uh, uh, culture of expulsion is created, especially or at the beginning in the universities. And we have a lot of evidence about how this expulsive culture uh, manifests in the daily life of women in the universities specifically. Then, uh, this is one point I want to raise. And the second point I want to raise um, is a, a reflection that we have. If until now women, we haven't participated in the development of enter IT enterprise and the business model that this IT enterprise uses, until now we haven't participated in that. This uh, business model, this enterprise are created mostly by men then there is not the time to really develop new business model. It's not the time to really develop new IT business based in totally other references. Yes, more environmental responsibility, more uh, data privacy, more uh, uh, algorithms transparency, more um, business related with the problems of the daily life of the women. Then this is uh, we have built a, a model of uh, a business model uh, integrated or uh, created with uh, five principles that I'm going not to share because of the time. But uh, uh, this is the time for women to really define another IT industry and another business model. 
Thank you very much, Kemli. Um, and apologize to everyone for this, the very small interventions from our panelists, but in the next session of this panel, we will have more time and a round table just so everybody can rejoin the discussion and participate, or maybe even add up one or two points. Um, I'm now gonna give the floor to Smita. Yes, um, Smita, you have five minutes. Thank you. Um, I wanted to actually focus a little more on what we mean by gender when we speak uh, about gender, of women and gender diverse persons in this report, right? Um, because uh, one of the, th when I read through the draft report, uh, one of the things that really stood out was the fact that there is not enough information on gender diverse persons uh, to actually even contribute meaningfully to the report. And that is a problem. Uh, and it's also important to <coughs> then see why is this a problem, right? Because right now, uh, the, the topic of pink economy is big, especially with LGBTQ persons, and this is, of course, specifically more in um, Western countries and US, and uh, it's slowly growing in other uh, countries like India, where now there is a relatively like legal, lesser legal barriers towards, um, you know, at least homosexuality. Trans rights is still a problem, um, but in spite of the growing pink economy and. Pink economy is so huge, it's, it's like $4.6 trillion, that's bigger than Germany's GDP, right? In spite of this, when you want to look up information about digital economy and gender diverse persons, there is next to nothing. Um, this is not to say that um, uh, digital economy has not helped uh, queer persons, because in, in, in several of the cases, there have been instances where uh, to avoid discrimination in physical workspaces, um, trans persons and gender queer persons have taken to um, jobs which are uh, part of the gig economy, which are part of digital economy, to earn income. But this is a small part of it, right? Because when you think about, firstly, like when you think about technology itself, when we start talking about it, when we talk about in, talk about including um, um, people, like you know how we need to close the gender gap online, we how we need to. Um, provide access to women. It's always provide access to only women. There is it, the, the conversation hasn't yet gone beyond gender uh, binary here, right? Um, if you look at the technology itself, uh, we all know that a lot of the people who create technology are men. That's true, which is why the gender gap exists. But if we go, uh, if we don't talk about non-binary genders when we're talking about closing the gender gap, it will be too late. By the time we get to, like, you know, you can't solve, like, okay, let's deal with women right now, and then we'll go to the gender, other genders which exist. If that is the attitude which we have, we are implicitly creating a hierarchy, and this hierarchy is something which can never be, like, closed, right? Um, if you look at digital economy itself, um, what are some of the barriers which um, gender diverse people face when you're taking up jobs as a part of the digital economy? One is when you look at, one is the construction and design of apps, especially in app-based economy, right? Uh, one is the construction of the apps themselves. A lot of the food delivery apps in India, for example, by default use male pronouns to refer to the delivery persons. Um, they, the logos which they use in Uber. Now, actually, um, in the last update, Uber has started showing female drivers, but I don't know um, if they have actually changed the language to um, accommodate for female drivers. And this is just language in one level. There's also the dependent, uh, the degree of dependence we have on facial recognition on, and on visual identification of people here, right? So who gets stuck in the gaps? Um, if, so uh, by facial recognition, what I mean is that when you get an Uber, uh, when you book an Uber, one of the first things that they tell you is check your number plate and check if the person who's driving the vehicle matches the um, identity, matches the photo online, right? Um, this is very worrying. Because when you are queer, one of your one of your the most private things you have is your, your is your visual identity. Um, do you have to compromise on your privacy just because you want to live um, a, a dignified life where you can afford things like food and stay? No. Um, next is also the fact that a lot of yes. Uh, next is also the fact that a lot of uh, digital economy is also very dependent on cards and banking system. This is a huge barrier for trans persons and genderqueer persons because you may not have official documents which match with your self-identified gender. Um, and where do you bring up these issues, right? Like in spaces like IGF, and what does IGF registration start with? It starts with your prefix, Mr., Miss, Doctor, Professor, 
right? I am neither doctor nor professor, but neither am I a Mr. or Miss. So where do I go? If I can't bring up the issue here, and if I come here also, the space is not safe for many genderqueer people or trans persons. So it's, a, it's a discrimination on several levels. It's not just apps, it's also the places where we're supposed to mitigate these issues, which are not uh, accessible, which are not safe. And this is something which needs to be addressed at several levels. And we cannot start at the binary and then say that we will address all of this later. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Smita. Um, last but not least, we will have Anita. Anita Gurumuti, I, I hope I pronounced the name correctly. And you have five minutes. Thank you. Yeah, thanks after those inspiring presentations. Um, I think when we talk in a forum where we're telling stories about women, women's empowerment, gender, gender diverse people, you always have this challenge of whether you're telling stories of resilience, of change, or are you telling stories of struggles, challenges, pushbacks? And in the context of you know, women and the digital economy, there is always this question as to whether you're telling stories about women or you're telling stories about the economy. So I think in this context, I'm going to um, try and focus a little bit on the economy itself, and I'm going to focus on the broad challenges. Um, Bruna, I'm not very sure that we live in a post-access world, uh, or we're getting there even, because what we are told uh, by official statistics is that after 2013, Africa remains the only continent where the digital gender gap has widened. Secondly, in a country like mine, um, where um, GSMA has found that 16% of Indian women are using mobile and internet services, and this is 2019. But on the other hand, I'd also like to actually um, reflect a little bit on the idea of access. Well, maybe it's a post-access world in a very perverse sense. And what is that perverse sense? That, I feel, is your default integration against your consent, regardless of whether you know, you're a user or not, into this larger digital economy. So your integration as a user may not count at all in the way in which the economy is designed. What do I mean by this? If you look at the ILO's gender pay gap report for 2018-19, it tells you, based on big data modeling, that whatever you do, you're not going to be able to break the glass ceiling, which means the digital gender pay gap is going to remain for the foreseeable and non-foreseeable future. So it means that regardless of whatever access we give women you know, to skills, technology, you know, for whatever, the economy is so brutal that it's going to leave women behind. Post-access also means that you may not even have a gadget, you may not even own a mobile phone, but the fact that the digital economy is bringing about automation, 3D printing, and all of those things, or things beyond your own control, may result in your losing a job as a garment factory worker. So this is post-access for you. What is this digital economy? Digital eco economy is a reorganization of production and value chains. And indeed, the economy itself is very fluid. It's local as it is global, because we live in a globalized world where value chains are organized from global to local and local to global. All sectors are changing, and this is impacting labor relations. And for, I would just like to give a couple of illustrations. In India, if you look at on-demand work, we have uh, done very uh, small research. But at this point in time, what we understand is that Women who may be integrated into platforms like Urban Clap, you know, offering services, are completely squeezed. The, the algorithm games them in a way that if you've just joined the platform, you may not get opportunities. If you've proven your loyalty and you're there, then you get some rewards. You have lots of punitive disincentives on these platforms because you, know, you may not have reached there you know, right in time. You may have had a transport problem, but who cares? And many of these workers really want to be out of these oppressive relationships with the platform and set up their own enterprises, but policies do not really allow them to set up their own MSMEs or small enterprises. Mainstream market models in, let's say, 
domestic workers on a platform, they operate completely on racist ideas. So the ad, ads actually say, uh, gift your wife a wo domestic worker and not a diamond ring. So this is like an upper middle class man telling his wife, you know, this wedding anniversary, I'm going to give you a domestic worker on a platform. The second illustration I want to give is uh, of microwork. And microwork is not the way we imagine it to be across geographies with flexibility in the gig economy. But actually, these are all new social enterprises embedded in local feudal relations of paternalism with minimum wage problems, punitive environments, with performance-based kinds of controls and highly surveilled workspaces because this, this is the environment in which data annotation takes place and any data leaks will compromise Europe and the GDPR standards of Europe. So women in one part of the world are surveilled so that the data protection rights in another part of the world may be upheld. So I will end by saying that um, we do need um, policy changes from global to local and these really need to be based not only on uh, traditional uh, policy areas, but also emerging policy areas like digital infrastructures and data. Thank you very much, Anita. Um, we have more 20 minutes of this session. 20 minutes? 25. Until 25, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the idea now is it's more of a round table, just, just so everybody who is here and attending this session has the opportunity to offer some more inputs or ideas. So the floor is pretty much yours. Anyone who is wishing to give a contribution either to our report or if you have doubts on our report, um, please raise your hand. Maria Paz will be taking names um, and whoever else wants to, to join the discussion. Now I'll open the floor now. We had, um, I'm not, uh, um, I'm not sure if you um, are able to say a little bit about the Feminist Internet Research Network. So, and there's also, um, who's here from Digital Empowerment Foundation? Not here, no. No, no, I'm just, I'm just saying these are people that I communicated with who said they might be able to share, so. Um, Feel free. I know we weren't able to give everyone a platform, but um, there were several other people who have contributed content. So, and then there's also the Feminist Internet Research Network, which is run by the um, um, Association for Pro uh, Progressive Communications. And the research is not quite out yet, but if I understand correctly, there'll be quite a lot of research coming out of that network that looks at the topics that we've discussed today. Well, what a privilege. I jumped the queue. I apologize. We'll be very short. So the Feminist Research Network, it's a very simple idea. Uh, research needs to be done and contextualized by the people that live in the places we're from. And this is what uh, you all have talked. So the idea was to, to support uh, and to work together uh, learning uh, from a feminist perspective. It's a work in progress. Researchers are from uh, a different part of the world from India, from uh, Kenya, uh, some are probably here. I will not enter into the conversation. I just think that whoever is interested and in working already on this, it's a, it's a transversal intersectional way to build evidence because this is what we notice, evidence is missing because the very person that have the, the analysis are not able to access the spaces where the analysis should be shared. So just this. Thank you very much, Vali. Um, anyone else? Uh, thank you. I'd like to speak about, uh, with the uh, speaker about Palestine as an outsiders. We'd like to have more elaborative uh, literature, more what we can do as an outsiders to help you uh, on that issue. The literature about that on the internet is very uh, little, it's, it's weak, and we need more about uh, that. Thank you for speaking, and I hope uh, you give us more information what we can do as outsiders to help this situation. Thank you very much. Should I take another? Um, Alison, do you want to? Yeah, <laughs> if you want to say anything. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, like as we were saying in our um, 
uh, yeah, the, uh, more information about what you can do as outsider. Do you mean like people in the diaspora, like how they can be engaged with the uh, issue, with the whole um, issue about gender and economy and Palestinians? Yeah, like we were saying in our our presentation that it's highly connected to the occupation, the access of Palestinian women. So of course we. Um, <coughs> things related to that kind of end up taking the priority in some senses. And I think that's why it's important also for us to be in venues where we do speak about the gender aspect, because sometimes it's probably people experience in other countries as well. When you have uh, issues of occupation or issues of a uh, high level of human rights violations for different, maybe broader uh, root cause issues that sometimes the issue of women or um, the issue of gender non-conforming communities ends up being uh, marginalized further, so it's important also to have this topical discussions. Um, in regards to what we have said so far about creating an environment that would be safe for women, Palestinian women, um, it has a lot to do with harassment online, um, uh, family control, um, lack of uh, proper judicial and law enforcement responses to real violence that's happening, um, and then, um, I mean, you can think of different cases in which, for example, we have one case of a uh, Palestinian who went to a shelter because his, uh, him or their family was uh, pursuing them for their uh, sexual orientation, mm -hmm. and they went seeking a safe harbor, and their family found them and came after them, and there was violence in the street related to this issue, but then a whole wave of online violence happened, um, and then what, where people were saying a lot of hateful things, um, towards the LGBTQI community in Palestine. Um, so we always have to think about how also as people are in the physical space and the violence that they're experiencing in the physical space, you can also see how the online space enables its amplification. And that creates the chilling effect, which doesn't only silence freedom of expression, but silences people's engagement with the economy and the access to the digital economy. I think what also stands out from the, 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 the Palestine case is that Palestinian women are generally highly educated. And it, again, it, 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 but if you have a context of political disempowerment and control, that has ma massive impact. Whereas what you find in a lot of the ICT4D, and I think who was it? Um, Kemley was saying there's so many initiatives that are skilling women in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and, and, and mathematics. Um, but many of these initiatives assume that that's the only barrier, that lack of education is the primary barrier. But when you actually look at people's stories in different contexts in different parts of the world, there are many other factors that, that are disablers um, for participation. And I think not, and they're more complex, they're more local, they're more context specific, so they're often not taken into account. Okay, um, I had two more hands, two or one more hand raised? Ah, okay, so we have one here on my right and then you will be the next one. Can you please introduce yourself? I'm Kathleen Diga, I'm with the Association for Progressive Communication. I just wanted to touch upon again uh, what Shalini was talking about, uh, this crafter space and innovation. Um, and it really is an innovative mechanism of creating e-commerce using the mesh in an offline network that is affordable. Because to get online for women in, in this particular place in a rural area where internet is uh, not even available or even affordable, this is providing that, uh, that, that opportunity to, to engage in the digital economy. And uh, I guess that also touches upon um, some work uh, that's been done by uh, WeGo, which is the Women in Informal uh, Employment, Globalizing and Organizing. Marty Chen had an article 2016 around informal workers and that it really is just the basic mobile phone that's affordable to informal workers and not being able to afford computers and the internet connection uh, just then means that it, it remains divergent for the wealthy class to take advantage of the digital economy and remains out of reach for uh, the rest. And it's only with, you know, individual maybe sacrifice and finance that 
then digital participation happens and opportunities for uh, you know, poor people or uh, low-income persons to, to engage uh, in that type of access to particular devices. And uh, there's been also discussion when I talk about informal work of those who are in the informal economy who collect e-waste. So where is that in the digital economy and, and environmental uh, discussions and, and amongst um, women and, and gender diverse people? Uh, I think uh, it might be a space that needs further research or if it's out there to maybe uh, take another look and I will make my contributions by Monday for you, Henriette. <laughs> But yeah, I think a little more uh, look into the informal economy and ICTs and the use for digital, this digital space would be um, most needed. Thank you very much. Um, if you want to take one of the microphones here at the table. Um, hi everyone, thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Judy Kayal, I am a feminist. Um, recently with Oxfam, we did a, co a convening, f uh, we gathered digital feminists um, on a conversation on digital feminism. Um, as we both know, there is a growing organizing online on different topics. And our goal was to create a space on unpacking why are women and gender diverse people using the internet to break silences either anonymously or publicly, but also unpack on different ways, even when they dare to access freedom online, they also are attacked and kind of lose that freedom by not being able to publicly own their voices. Uh, what I wanted to talk on is even though we talk about digital right, um, patriarchy doesn't stop in offline spaces. It comes with us in online spaces, which means that uh, not when we talk about online accessibility, there are intersections that we shouldn't forget in terms of race, gender, and also social class. Uh, like my grandmother right now, she has a phone that can access WhatsApp and I can video call her, but up to now she doesn't know how to do it because of lack of education. So she has accessibility to that technology, but because of lack of education, she can WhatsApp call her granddaughter to talk with her. Uh, my mom uh, is a well-educated woman who can still know how to use Twitter, and most of the time she want to know what's going on. See, th there is a lot of layers that comes when we talk about online accessibility and also how patriarchy has kept women and then the most oppressed among us as women to not being able to access that. So I was really happy when he touched, um, sorry if I used the wrong pronoun, um, when they touched on the diverse ways we can unpack layers that comes with not accessing internet. It's not only women and girls, there are layers, poor women, underprivileged women, black women, brown women, what type of women are we talking about? It is important that we unpack on all of that because we, it comes with a lot of layers and also it comes with different regions and what it's, what's happening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any further interventions? Okay, so um, another part of this this last and finishing part of our panel was for us to maybe get some input for future um, subjects that the BPF can address. Um, a little bit of how this happened. So we will, right after the IGF, we will release the final report. And then um, the final report will be submitted to the Secretariat. Um, and then next year, our MAG members will be, um, they have to propose a new subject and, and provide, provide reasons to why the best practice forum on gender and access, they, it should continue. And we often do this with, um, with a proposition of a subject to be discussed. So if any of you um, has any suggestions or topics you would like to see being addressed by this group, um, this would also be the moment for you guys. And the floor is open again. Can I just in complement to what Bruna mentioned, so I'm Maria Paz Canales, uh, a co facilitator, and I'm a MAC member, uh, and I will keep engaged with the BPF work, hopefully, for the next year. But it's not only about also the topics that you want us maybe to propose to working on in the, in, a, in the next iteration of this BPF, but it also to hear more about you, uh, about what 
kind of methodologies of work are better for you in terms of reach out because uh, we know that this is time consuming, but we really want to have more active partici participation of everyone that is interact uh, interested in this topic in order to better reflect the wonderful job that you are doing in each one of your, from each one of your places. So both are very welcome in terms of, uh, even if this imply a little bit of criticism of how we have worked in the last uh, time, uh, everything is welcome because will help us to improve for the next year. And this is for you, you are the BBF. So uh, we need the community to be alive and, and participating. Thank you. Um, hello everyone, uh, my name is Deborah and I'm from Brazil. I work at uh, the Institute for Technology and Society, it's an NGO based in Brazil. Um, but just to give my um, two cents, not even five, um, I think one of the topics that could be interesting for us to explore is even maybe a fourth dimension on access, meaning um, first, we are talking about infrastructural access. Then we are talking about um, access to uh, internet in itself. Then we're talking about what content is there and um, how can we actually have the skills to access that content. But how about if you go through all of these three maybe layers and then you get there and you have cyberbullying and you have digital online violence um, and you cannot actually continue to use uh, that online space. So I think maybe this could be um, a, um, a topic or a series of topics that we could address specifically on gender violence online. Um, on just um, uh, uh, my two cents on the topic. Thank you. Um, thank you, Deborah. Um, just, to, just to make sure that I mention it to you all, um, gen online abuse and gender-based violence was one of was the approach of 2015. But maybe um, if that's um, the need, and maybe we can find ways of restructuring and, and expanding the, the debate and what was the research at the time. So um, it's also worth mentioning that every single report of the BPF is available at the IGF website. And maybe on these upcoming weeks, the exercise will be to take a look on them and see what we still need to address and how can we still address it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we'll be quick. I would like to build on what had been said in the first round, second round. So if we want really to have gender diverse people, why we don't do work and access? What are the barriers that prevent? Because it's this, no? It's uh, how you can come if you have to disclose yourself to a certain point where you lose safety. What kind of barriers, physical barriers, if people have to come here when from the registration and thing? Because if this has to be the one net, I think it's the non-net. is the net of the one that are white, have privileged passport, have a good bank account that they can come every time with no hassle at all. So I think if we really want, let's have uh, for all this community, what are the barriers? Because access, it's a very thick word. And then we can build with the other issue on work, because I think that is true on labor. There is a lot, a lot that needs to be said. I guess we have two more on this side, and then Nadira and Zmita. Um, I just wanted to mention and maybe build up on what you said, the financial part of it. I think this is, as we can see in this room, where a lot of underrepresented people in the world of tech were not all uh, white cis men. And um, I think that's also a big problem that we as underrepresented people have to put our time and volunteer our time and come to these places. I mean, this is happening during the week. If we all work, then we have to cancel work and come here just to be able to speak about this. And this is unpaid work that we have to do added to our normal work where we also have to nonstop prove ourselves just to be able to stay on the same level as everybody else. And I think this is just added and added and added. And this leads to people burning out because one, they always have to prove themselves. Two, they also have to pick other people up and do these extra volunteering stuff just because they see the problem. They're sitting in a room full of uh, men working and programming. And um, that's also like, I, if I can just say a statistic from Germany, we have um, for women over 40, 40% 40 leave tech 
people that have been in tech, and for men this is only 20%, and it's also, it's just this burnout that is happening to all, every underrepresented person that has to do this volunteer work and do their work and also prove themselves 10,000 times at work, and I think this is also a huge topic that needs to be talked about, this unpaid work and burden that we all go through. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nadira and then yeah. Smita. I'm just very simple uh, comment. Uh, uh, it's just we are talking about dynamic condition for gender, and I, th I think we are still uh, working in silos. We, we have to have uh, some uh, uh, male contributing is even to our discussions. That's my one point. Yeah, thanks. Hi. Uh, in terms of, uh, it's just a suggestion for uh, the next BPF, uh, which we were discussing. I think it might be important to look at algorithmic decision making and um, machine learning and how these actually pose barriers to not just access, but also to handling online violence, to also seeing who participates online and who doesn't, and also the economy constructed by the digital space. Because like a very, very recent example is of Facebook, um, where on Facebook they found out that the job ads and openings which were, the, which were um, uh, shown to people was based on their gender as well as age. Right? Like people over the age of, I think, 40 or 45 were not shown certain kind of job openings which had higher pay, and neither were women. So um, I think this is something, if we, it, it's important to tackle it sooner rather than later, because um, more and more it's not the humans who are directly, um, you know, uh, causing the barriers, but, but what has been taught to machines and what machines are learning every single day. So maybe this is something which would be interesting. An excellent uh, suggestion. Excellent. Okay. Thanks, Bruna. Um, yes, I mean, I think, I think we can, we could. I think, I think when we look at what to do with the IGF gender BPF, we, BPF, we should look at the IGF context as well. I mean, we can share information. Um, we can we can collaborate and gather research, but. I'm trying to think what would be useful in this space. And, and maybe the fact that this is a, a global platform, that it's supposedly multi-stakeholder, so we have policymakers, we have companies, maybe something that does look at the platforms and looks at, 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 um, at gender in the context of, um, of, of platform work, companies like Uber, um, other practices of, of social media companies, because we can get them here. And, and, and what I would like us to do more, and I think the MAG, you know, the MAG has to listen to what the BPF says, is to actually work in a more continuous way. I think t generally the way that it has been working in the BPF, and there's partly the funding. Like I was appointed as a consultant in, I think, July, August. I think with, um, what was it? Was it um, it wasn't Anuradha, but the, the consultant last year as well, um, Radhika. Um, so, is, so is there a way we can actually use the material that we have gathered with this year's BPF, build on some of the content, some of the issues, some of the gaps that, that some of you have um, pointed to, and actually come up with something that we can present as a challenge um, at the at the next IGF, actually, for the BPF, not just to have a BPF session, but to organise uh, a debate, or you know, uh, some kind, and and getting the ILO here, getting some of the employers here, so that we actually take it a little bit further. So I'm not sure. I just think that that we need to decide: do we want to explore new areas? It's very useful to do that, but do we want to work in a more sort of targeted way? I think there are different ways. And as Maria Paz said, um, as a MAG member, you would like it to be inclusive and participative. So it would be good to get your feedback on that. How do we approach this to be strategic and try and have some kind of impact? Um, I, I think it, I will support a lot what Henriette uh, is saying, but um, to be honest, I, I think we have to reflect a little bit more and strong in, in the alternatives. Is it possible? Is it possible to create other kind of digital economy, or are we with with uh, with Anita that the digital economy is going to to be uh, to put us on to the down? Yes, it's, it's really we we as women can propose another another 
kind of uh, business, another kind of platform with other principles? Can we or not? Yes, I think we have to think also to the alternatives, to, to hack the digital economy, if, if we can say in, in one way. Then I think we have to understand very well how that is working, yes, and how the gender is, is working in the platforms, but also try to build alternatives or, or try to, to tr try alternatives. And uh, in, in relation with the way and document, yes, exactly. And and the, the the way to work, I think we have a lot of topics here. To be honest, yes, the topics are very interesting topics. I don't know if it's possible. I don't know if if uh, work like in group like topics. I don't know, but an inclusive process will be very nice for the next year at the at this topic at the gender. Um, one last year. Uh, yeah. So. <coughs> Just thinking about the um, how to use this forum in the best way, um, I think that kind of there's a few stakeholders in the room beyond just the companies themselves, but also I think the development policies of development organizations also um, greatly impacts the work that's being done in this sector. sector and the possibility of kind of having um, digital rights related issues be a part of the um, economic development policies. So when you're teaching an entrepreneur, you don't just teach them how to build an app, but you teach them about digital ethics and privacy related issues. Um, and look at like, um, yeah, the, the other aspects of the entrepreneurship and how it relates to digital rights. And then also from a research lens perspective, like for the next year, we're doing um, now a, a research about Palestinians access to the digital economy in general. And we'll look at a number of platforms and see their access. But then I would, I don't know actually how I would bring the gender uh, perspective to that. I'm starting to understand from what you said, like, oh, okay, checking to see if it's Mr. or Ms. or who can sign up and how, but like, if there was even just a one page like or a few page document that gave me some research questions and also explained to me the type of evidence that I should be collecting links or policy um, policy related things or links to um, different types of evidence then I would know how to do that in my research for next year and when it came back to this table I would be much better prepared so that would be very helpful um, and then in regards to the companies and the recommendations to the companies I think the evidence collecting and the understanding like that would enable us to develop a set of recommendations towards next year where we could target specific companies for the way that they are conducting their either hiring practices or their business in different ways and make better um, uh, recommendations. Yep. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, we need to wrap up this session because we ran out of time. But I'd like to thank you all for being here. I think, I do believe that the IGF um, might not be the most ideal space, but we're trying to foster the gender discussion around. And um, spaces like these are all very important in, in, in years in which um, you can really count in your hand the amount of gender-related debates at the IGF. So I think there were like two or maybe four, so something like that. Yeah, we need to keep this space and we need to keep discussing with each other. So maybe discussing avenues for proposing panels next year, maybe bombarding the IGF with hundreds of panels on gender or things like that. This is the space in which we should strategize around this. So, yeah. If you guys need anything else, or if you guys have any doubts about the BPF work, please reach out to us, um, and we want to keep on working with you all. Thank you very much for being here. Um, thanks, Bruna. I'm sorry, there are more hands, but I'm sorry we've run out of time. I want you to check, is everyone signed up to the BPF mailing list? Who's not signed up to the BPF mailing list? You probably are. Well, if you're not, the link is on the, the website. And I'm afraid, I, I know people don't want more mailing lists than their lives, but that is the only way we have of, of, of working. And it will be important for you to participate because I think the first MAG meeting is going to be in uh, probably February, February, January or February. So by then we would want, with your input, some kind of idea of what the focus of the BPF should be for next year. Uh, sorry, just one quick thing. Uh, just uh, another, you know, important intersectional activity at the IGF with respect to gender is a gender dynamic coalition. 
and tomorrow morning at 9.30 is a session for the Gender Dynamic Coalition and this time it's a little different in the sense that we're kind of using the space to learn more and uh, my colleague Dr. Anya Kovacs will be sharing her research on body and data and looking at data as not just a resource but putting the body back in this current age of datafication. So I hope to see you all there tomorrow at 9.30. It's in uh, Sal B, if I'm not mistaken. Salbi. One of these, Sal B, yes. Thank you. Next. Yeah, the next one. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Sorry, just uh, one more uh, announcement. On Friday between 9.30 and 11, we have a session called Internet Detox, looking at what to do with some of the issues that were being raised here about gender-based cyber violence. It's in room five, so I request all of you to come join the discussion.